Skype tells me it's been uh, it's been a few months since we last sat here and recorded this uh, new episode type thing. Yeah, crazy. What you said, four months? Yeah, I think it's four months. May second. <laughs> I think we agreed to like an eight week break. <laughs> Something like that. I mean, I, I, you know, we managed to get some content out. We had a few things uh, in the hopper still ready to edit. So, uh, yeah, we we could have been a little more diligent about the timeline. But you had some exciting stuff going on with your 30 by 40 business. And, hey, it's summer. Things got busy. Things happened. People, thankfully, didn't fall off in droves as far as I can tell. So hopefully they're as excited as uh, I am and you are, I'm sure, about uh, putting out a new episode. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, strangely, I'm sure you're this way, too. But I filled the time. I managed to fill all that time vacuum <laughs> with work. <laughs> Which yeah, you I, did. Honestly, it's been so great, man. I, I've had a great couple of months and having the headspace to do that uh, was huge. So, you know, thanks to everybody who uh, put up with the fact that we didn't put out regular episodes. Summer's a slow time anyway, and it ended up being a really busy time for me for work-wise. What, what did you fill your time with? Yeah, I did not fill it with work. Uh, I probably watched a little more uh, television than normally, maybe in this slot. I don't know. I did some long walks in there. I, I, we had some travel as well, it being summer, but uh, definitely caught up on a few series over the summer that I've been meaning to watch. So um, maybe not as productive as yours, maybe sometimes productive, but it, it was great. Um, you know, it's been a good time. We had a lot of great memories this summer. So uh, yeah, I, I missed the show, but uh, it's not like we sat around. Uh, you know, whittling, as I always like to say. Well, I've, I've been excited to have this conversation for a while because it, it lets us kind of fill in the second half of uh, a line that we've referenced a couple of times on this show. And that refers to when you came out to California along with Laura, met up with uh, me and Lori and some of our friends and celebrated our recent milestone birthdays. And now you've crossed that line, too. So, hey, we're both 50 and old. Uh, and someone's going to comment that that's not old and that's totally OK, but it's older than we were last year. But anyhow, we felt it was a good reason to celebrate. And in fact, we went out to dinner at a restaurant that we claimed would get us kicked out of the fire movement. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for some of you, that may be true. But uh, we did uh, elect to celebrate our 50th birthday in style. We drove up north to Napa, California uh, area and went to the French Laundry, which is a three Michelin star restaurant. Very famous. Um, and I had never been there before. You had never been there before. It was uh, quite a, a splurge, to say the least. But I uh, had a wonderful time. And, uh, you know, on the flip side, it got me thinking about this idea of spending because the cost of that, you know, the days we spent up there, the cost of that meal, you know, were things that we had discussed in advance. They were known entities. But, you know, it's just one example and maybe an extreme example of the idea of having to decide whether an expense is worth it or not. And that's a really great kind of two sides of five conversation, because whether you're accumulating still and trying to get over the line or you've already retired and you're thinking about that budget and how we're going to do, I think there's an awful lot to cover. Yeah. Do we want to kind of put some uh, some numbers to this so people have uh, an idea? Because <laughs> I I mean, it was it's kind of an extreme level. I've never eaten at a Michelin star restaurant ever. And then to, uh, to have eaten at one of the world's best um, was kind of a big jump. And I was shocked at the initial price. Um, but that's only part of the story. <laughs> Because yeah, you, you get there. It's a fixed price menu, which includes a gratuity um, for the whatever size party. I think it's twenty percent or whatever. And then um, you basically choose your wine, you know, drinks, cigars, after dinner drinks, whatever you want is enhancements to the menu. Enhancements, yeah, it's everything's an extra, basically. So that's only part of of the story. Um, do you want to say how much it costs? I mean, I think you asked me that like I have not put that number so far out of my head at this point because I honestly don't want to remember. <laughs> but at the end of the day, all rolled in, you know, per couple, we're talking more than $2,000, right? Yeah. 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 S so a ton of money. Yeah. A ton of money relative to my monthly budget towards your monthly expenses. Um, it, it's a lot of money uh, spent on that weekend. And that excludes the other activities we did, the cost of lodging to stay up there, the gas, so that three days we were up there cost us a lot. The flight. <laughs> oh, well, yes. You, people <laughs> gracious enough to fly across the country uh, just to visit uh, us uh, like you and Laura did. Uh, you had an added expense. Sorry I, about that. I'm just that. going to say, the, um, you know, when your wife proposed this idea to me in secret, she's like, ah, here's what I'm thinking of doing. 
are you on board? I, the reaction for me was immediate. I'm like, yes, absolutely. Yes. That's awesome. And, um, so no question about wanting to do it and then just figuring out, okay, well, how much is this going to be? You know, I knew it was an expensive, um, tasting menu. Um, but yeah. I also knew that the experience was on my list of things that I really wanted to do. And just thinking about doing, being able to experience that with you guys and you guys have done uh, that kind of restaurant before in the past. And I remember you saying, well, we made a certain judgment at a certain point that just wasn't worth it to us to do this anymore. Like the experience just didn't, didn't pan out. And I wonder yeah. what changed your mind there? Was it just the event, the occasion? Yeah. Well, and for sure, Lori is more in that camp than I am, uh, oh. at least pre fire. I was still, you know, intrigued by these, you know, elaborate kind of tasting course to meals, you know, th that are common at two, especially two and three Michelin star restaurants. Uh, but I was also on board with the idea of, you know, that's not a, a ne necessity. It's not something we did often anyway. It was a rare treat. But, you know, we both like sort of more down to earth experiences anyway, without a lot of pretense. Uh, and so I was on board with it. But, you know, on the other hand, when it came to like, what, what might I like to do for a special occasion down the road, a milestone anniversary or a birthday? Sure, that idea has never left my mind. And I loved the idea of going to a dinner like this. And even more that Lori so thoughtfully came up with the idea of inviting other special people in our lives to it uh, to join us uh, if they were interested. So yeah, not something that, that I'm comfortable engaging in all the time, but I love the idea as a special occasion celebration. So let's talk about like what what it was that we we got there. First of all, the building is amazing. It's been recently renovated by a pretty well known architecture firm um, from Norway um, called Snoeta, and they did this beautiful renovation of this kitchen. And you kind of entered to this beautiful courtyard, well landscaped. It's got this outdoor eating terrace, which I think you can reserve. And private yeah. parties can reserve wood slats, fritted glass, um, vines, everything you, if you've ever seen an image of the French laundry, you know, you know, that the blue door coming in this kind of courtyard space. It's just, it's really welcoming. There was a part of me that wanted to savor every moment of the experience. Cause I mean, I'm an architecture junkie anyway. So right. I wanted to see the building from the outside and it's got this little ribbon glass where you can look into the kitchen and see all the chefs working and the fritted pattern on the glass is a motif, um, sort of taken from the arms, you know, the waving motions of the chefs as they're preparing food. So there's all these like little details and they yeah. really want you to take your reservation and start the experience. So we got sat in the, on the second floor in the corner. And if you've seen an image of the restaurant on their menu or anywhere, it's that corner window. We were on the second, second floor there. It's kind of a chamfered space. The lighting level was perfect. It was like one foot candle. It's like moonlight in there, which I love personally. And these kind of small lampshades, which had, you know, a pattern that you would see on laundry watermarked into the shade. And there's one candle on the center of the table. You know, we're all seated around a circular table. Very simple, the decor in there. I mean, I don't know how you felt walking in, but it was it way over delivered on that part of the experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, for sure, I didn't have the profound appreciation of the architecture that you did. I remember you pointing out things as we were walking up that I hadn't even taken in yet. I was kind of I guess I was a step back looking at the scene as a novice um, might be. But uh, the more you pointed out, the more I definitely started to notice. And, you know, for me, I remembered, you know, just kind of being caught by the moment more than anything of when we sat down together and just, hey, you know, these are, you know, eight people who are special to me and who are choosing to to spend not only their their money, but their time um, away from work, away from whatever they have to do to be here and experience this with me. And I remember being uncharacteristically quiet. I don't know that you remember that about me, but I certainly yeah. remember yeah. thinking like I haven't said anything in a little while. And so um, I was definitely anticipating, uh, you know, what was to come at that moment. I remember that kind of clearly, but yeah, I was just kind of struck by the, uh, kind of the importance of the moment and, uh, excited about what was going to come. And they placed the, you know, the menu is in front of you. It's got your name at the top of it. You know, it's a special tasting menu for, for Jason's 50th. They had, it has the classic clothes pin with printed the, the French laundry p printed on it. It's holding yeah. your, your napkin. And it's like, the tablecloth is heavy weight 
and they present the amuse bouche, which do you remember what this is? That's the uh, salmon cornet, right? Yes. Yeah. Just an amazing little ice cream cone, which is, has these unexpected flavors in it. Um, they're well known for a couple of these, you know, initial Yeah, that's courses. one of them for sure. That's one of them. You know, then the dishes start rolling out. How, how many courses were in the menu? I don't even remember. 15? Yeah, that sounds right because he gives multiple desserts and things. And yeah. I, I, I lose track quickly. I have to look at the menu every time I think about it. I mean, the very first course was the oyster pearls dish yes another one of their famous uh dishes which was just mind-blowing every bit of the experience i really really enjoyed i mean i was i don't know if i was talking either because i was kind of blown away and there was a part of it where i felt i'm a little out of place here i remember when the sommelier comes over and wants to know hey what do we want to do for wine tonight so exactly why don't you talk about that yeah i mean it's uh something that we had anticipated we had discussed some options, at least some of the party did about what we might do. And we had some thoughts going in, but then, you know, when presented with it, uh, a couple of people in the group asked some questions and then we had to kind of, you know, circle the wagons by ourselves and decide, well, what are we going to do? Because, you know, you know, at, at least I know what I was thinking personally. I was like, well, I am on board with having a good wine experience. I'm, you know, been interested in wine for many years, have studied it. I, you know, have my fun job in wine. So I think about wine a lot. But on the same note, I also want to be both personally responsible about cost and also not sort of advocate for a position that would be, you know, too expensive for others. Because pretty much no matter what we do, because we're all people interested in wine in that group, um, no matter what we do, we're, the, the cost is going up now. And so what followed was a series of uh, almost negotiations, or at least <laughs> putting out ideas about what we might do. Like, what if we say like this much per person or, you know, do we want a new wine every course or is it more like every other course, which is roughly what we decided on. Right. And then what kind of cost would that be like? And so, you know, we went back and forth for a few minutes and I feel like it took him a little longer to get back than I had wanted. But, uh, I don't think it was because he was around the corner watching us like not decide. But, you know, we did come to a decision. Eventually they came back and, and we agreed, Hey, you know, you pick, this is the amount per person based on his recommendation, based on our budget we decided. And we just kind of went from there. Is that an accurate retelling? Yeah. I mean, I, I remember talking about it beforehand and saying, okay, this is kind of this is the budget range right. that we're thinking about. And we presented the budget range to the sommelier and he's kind of like, well, <laughs> I could do that, but nah, you're not going to have a great experience is basically what he said. Which, yeah. which is the classic upsell technique, right? Like right, he, right. he could make anything, he could work with any budget. Absolutely. Let's, let's be honest, right? Yeah, he's well-trained. But every glass is probably between 35 and $50 for an average glass and went up from there. And the, you know, the bottles there, <laughs> it's like off It the spans charts. the entire array that one could ever imagine. So it's so he did kind of put us in this position where we had to have the discussion about okay what what are you comfortable spending and there was some people right. there who have reached phi and there was some people there who hadn't reached phi, and who are who are striving toward it and so it's a different calculus for everybody we're all at different points on the path and I remember feeling like I Laura and I are having kind of a little side con conversation saying this we could be happy spending this amount but i think we would be less happy if we went over that amount and you know everyone right. was very respectful of that and we I think thankfully so. came to some kind of a consensus but i have to say the table there was two tables over from us who was two two guys and their dates and they were speaking to the sommelier like in between when we were and they were talking about their wine budget and i heard the guy say just keep it under 20,000 for the table uh yeah you remember that? Uh huh. Yeah, those guys. I couldn't figure out if they were actual high rollers or people who wanted others to think they were high rollers. It was just something seemed off. It but was yeah, a little I strange. I absolutely remember that. <laughs> Anyhow, even if it wasn't a joke, um, that would that's probably not something that would surprise them there. But I, no, it wouldn't. I, it it definitely set it set a different tone. I have to say, and you know, it's a rarefied experience. We knew it was going to be that, um, but and I feel like the food delivered on every level. I think we were probably the last people in the restaurant we that, were that night uh we got a tour of the kitchen at the end which was amazing yeah. i loved seeing all the behind the scenes there um you know you got birthday cake and you even got a sparkler i think uh, you? yes i did i felt very special <laughs> with my my birthday dessert but you know looking back on it what do you think worth it was the yeah. value there like what tell yes me. 
Honestly. So, you know, this conversation could go a lot of different ways and like everything we do, it's unscripted. So I don't know where it's going to go. But for me, in the pantheon of, uh, you know, expenses that I've incurred and especially thinking post FIC, post RE, because that's really where my brain is at this point. I didn't really question it at all. I, I for myself, like, you know, looking in hindsight, in other words, I don't think like, oh, that was stupid uh, because let's face it, if I want to speak relatively the cost of that meal for Lori and I was below the cost of the recent dental implant I had to have, right? <laughs> and I didn't question getting that implant. I needed to get that implant. I had a serious dental issue. Uh, and leaving a hole wasn't an option. It wasn't a good option. But that dinner, on the other hand, you know, was a totally optional. It was a choice. I could have pushed back against the idea. I could have never suggested the idea in years past that that's something I might want to do at 50. Um, when I think about the enjoyment that I got out of it and the time that we spent together, both at the dinner and you know the other days that we had available to us, which were much, le- much less costly, thankfully, um, I don't I don't question it for a minute. But it's also I'm saying that as somebody who is over the line, who has the ability to adjust spending, who already under withdraws. Versus what I can. So I know that's a privileged position to be in. Did it give me hesitation at all just to think about like this is a huge amount of money? Of course, I think about the numbers, but I don't look back at it in anything other than this was worth it for me at this time in my life with these people. How about you? I mean, you're coming from a very different standpoint about that meal. Yeah, I mean, we obviously had the means to do it and we wanted to do it as a special treat for, you know, our 50th to celebrate all of our 50th and, you know, to hang with you guys and meet some right. of your new friends. And like, it was all, all that I'd never give that up. No, I think it was totally worth it. I, it, it brings up the larger question of, and I know there's this kind of the Phi movement sometimes stratifies between, you know, lean fire, standard fire, chubby fire, right. and then you have all these sort of gradations and, you know, we could see some of those gradations present in that restaurant. I mean, they, passed around a cigar menu on the iPad at the end. Like you can buy cigars there, like $500 for a cigar. You know, it's like this like upsell after upsell after upsell. Honestly, during the meal, there was some upsells, right? Like, do you want? Yeah, there were some options, right? Do you want the thing with the truffles? Do you want the A5 Wagyu? You know, things like that. And we did not all elect to do all of them. There was at least one person who elected all of them. But um, I did pick one of them on my menu, not the $500 cigar, thank you. But, you know, yeah, you're right. There were opportunities to spend yeah. even more money. But it's that idea that if you don't ever sample the luxury, you don't really know what you're missing. And then yeah. by you, you can't really make a judgment based on whether, whether that's going to add value or something nice to your life. And I feel like, totally. the, you know, the extreme ends of this um, spectrum in the five movement tend to select for people who just make very different choices. And I was glad to be able to have the ability to make those choices. And, you know, did I need the Wagyu steak upgrade? Like I didn't need it, you know, I I didn't need it to make that experience like that much more luxurious. Some people decide to get it and they, and you know, share it with everybody at the table. I'm like, amazing. It was amazing. Um, and my God, maybe next time I would get it because there's another example of like, I I chose, I elected not to have that course. Yeah. But then when I had, it, I was like, Oh, wow, <laughs> this is, <laughs> yeah. this is mind blowing, you know? And so it just, it, it really made me, and I think Laura and I, as we reflect back on it, you know, we're totally happy that we did it. Would we have to spend that amount to get a similar experience? I think not. I want to kind of reverse a little bit. You took Laura and I with your family out to a French restaurant in your town the night, a couple nights before. Yeah, we went away um, up to Napa and that was an amazing meal. And it was yeah. it was a fraction of the price. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, one less than one tenth the price per person. And that was and, and you were paying. So thank you for treating us. <laughs> You're welcome. I appreciated that immensely. And so did Laura. But I just have to say, having that comparison there. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because I got most of the value. Yeah out of that meal and being able to talk with you guys and spend time with your family, like over the table, you know, sharing a meal, that's like a certain kind of intimate connection. And totally. when someone else is doing the cooking and the cleanup and you have really good food, like I thought that was a really great meal. It like, was. is it, is it memorable to the French laundry standard? Probably not, but 
I'll remember that meal for different reasons. And so it just, yeah. I don't know, it brought up all kinds of questions. I'm glad that we did it. I would never reverse the decision. Yeah, uh, it's an excellent point you make, of course. It's not like everything has to be to the same degree to get nearly the same enjoyment. And maybe it's not exactly the same enjoyment, but um, it just goes to show that it's certainly not a linear relationship between the cost of a thing and the value you derive from it. I was wondering if you and Lori have differences in what you'd spend money on One, you're valuing something over Lori. Cause Laura and I have like, when we go to stay at an Airbnb, uh, she would opt for a place that's less expensive. That's maybe further away or location wise. It's not ideal, but she would opt for that if it meant we could spend a longer time there. Whereas I never, I would never choose that at all. I would choose like you know, a different accommodation that costs a lot more because the surroundings there are more important to me, like where I'm at, the kind of house that I'm at, even if we have to truncate our stay. Do you guys have any differences like that? Uh, we definitely have differences. That isn't one of them. I think we're pretty well aligned on how we, you know, how we do lodging when we stay. And that's a good thing, given the amount we like to travel, that we're not <laughs> at loggerheads about it. But there are, you know, uh, at a high level, I think, I would say Lori is comfortable with an average higher burn rate than I am, uh, whereas I like to keep things the normal lower spend, and I have periodic expenses that are much higher. So uh, I, I'm more apt to have one-off purchases that are more expensive than she is. Um, I would say I also am more apt to be willing to spend on technology um, than she is. So some kind of electronics, whether it's you know computer related or you know when we, I remember when we replaced our camera, you know I just my default is to really go and do all the research. And often that ends up with a richer feature set than she's thinking we might need or the television, for example, um, you know, that as I'm looking at across the room, right? She would have picked a very nice television, I'm sure, but she wouldn't have picked at that time, like the best OLED out there, at, you know, at 60 inches. Yeah. Um, so we do differ on some of that stuff. She's more She's more apt to buy more pairs of shoes than I will, um, uh, for sure. Um, so her budget in certain areas is definitely higher than mine is. Um, but you know, yeah, those are maybe those are just a couple of examples that come to mind. But sure, we definitely think about spending in different ways from a category perspective. Yeah, I, I know when you guys were planning that trip out there and you were planning different ac activities and events and picking a place to stay, you know, you were basically making decisions for the whole group, you know, which I appreciate. And it's like, you got to do it at a certain level. But then, but then it's like, I remember um, she was planning to do this wine blending experience. And I was like, Oh, is that something we need to do? You know, there was, it was a bell in my head that was like, I'm not sure we need to do that, you know? And it's, yeah. it's that moment where you're not self-directing the spending that becomes a, okay, well, I got to, you know, I, clearly we're going to tag along, we're going to do this. And we ended up doing that thing. And it was like one of the best things that we did up there. So I, was, I totally appreciate it. And it just reminded me that sometimes when I hold back on spending, because if, if that was my vacation, I probably wouldn't have done that, yeah. you know, but having done it as a group and we could all go and learn about how they actually blend wines and what goes into it was incredible. I thought that was so much fun, you know, and it was kind of a bonding experience for a group of people who didn't like know each other all that well. Right. And, yeah. um, but I, if I hadn't spent that money, I would, you know, we just would have gone and done another winery or something like that, yeah. you know? And, uh, Laura and I, last time we went down to uh, the Virgin islands, we got spendy on this vacation. I was like, wow, we're just going to go all out. You know, the business had a great year. And, and yeah. so we got down there and I was like, well, let's provision the villa. You know, like, have you ever done this before? You, like, No, I don't know what that is. Okay. So when we fly um, from the East Coast to get down to the Caribbean, you're doing it over this, those winter breaks where everybody is traveling. And if there's any kind of travel hiccup, it's just it the delays stack on top of each other. So we know it's always a tr stressful travel day. So we decided to have someone do all of our shopping before we got down there. So they go, you, you give them a list of all the stuff you want and they go shop for you. And by the time you arrive uh. at your villa, it's all s stocked up for you. So your refrigerator is full and clean and there's food everywhere and you don't have to make those intermediate stops. Um, I gotcha. But it ended up being a service where like we paid a lot of money for it. And then we're like, eh we kind of missed going shopping. We got like, it's part ah, of the experience. You get there, you get off the boat and it's like, Oh, let's go get some coconuts and get some, you know, pick up some rum. And you know, it's like, 
there's a whole experience to it that yeah <laughs> we short circuited and we paid a lot more for it. So yeah. I don't know if you have anything like that where you've splurged on a luxury and weren't happy. Um, maybe not that I was going to say more to the former point. I'm thankful that Lori is the one that generally does lodging on our trips because she just has a knack for finding the right lodging for a situation. I was thinking, you know, way back the first time we've been twice to Costa Rica, the first time we went, which was pre pre fi, um, she found us an amazing place to stay that relatively speaking was affordable. I mean, it's not inexpensive, but it wasn't some luxury situation. There's this little villa at a place that only had, I think, four or five villas. And, you know, it seemed a little bit out there, you know, farther away from stuff. And I was wondering, like, you know, is this really going to be the right kind of experience? But, you know, when we went there, uh, you know, I, I trusted in what she was telling me. Obviously, I did my research, looked into it. But when we got there, it was such a great fit. We were really close to the beach. We could go out anytime. You know, we hit the, the people who ran the place, you know, she, clearly she looked into all this, were really accommodating. They were great resources. They were lending us stuff to, to do. Um, it was such a great experience. And I, I remember wondering back then, if I had been the one picking lodging, I bet I wouldn't have done as good of a job. I would have been like, Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's got to be in the right spot, but you know, being cost conscious is important. So, you know, maybe I wouldn't have even started with a villa. I don't even remember how she got on that idea, but it was clearly the right option. And we followed that same kind of idea again, some years later when we went somewhere, I know you and Laura have been and that's St. Lucia, you know, similar thing. We got a villa where there was just a few of them. It was in kind of a little more out of the way kind of location, but still close enough to stuff. Um, but you know, it's not like it was an area that had tons of lodging. Yeah. There were only a couple of options in that area and I, no way I would have stumbled on that one. But again, she found it great host, like everything was just awesome. Um, and so, you know, I definitely over the, it's a good example of like over the course of, you know, knowing someone, whether it's a relationship or a friend or what have you, like you definitely learn to trust someone's sense of whether something is worth it or not. I don't know if Lori would say the same thing about me. Yeah, I hope yeah. she would. But definitely when it comes to like travel lodging, like I think Lori just knows so well, like what type of experience is going to be. Really well, good you're lucky. Us. You're a lucky dog, man. When I was growing up, my dad, he was the one who was choosing all of the accommodation and he always chose based on one thing price price yeah <laughs> which i get right we'd show up to the motel like we i remember we were doing darien lake or great escape i think it was at the time northern new york yeah, um, exactly theme park and that was a big reach for them i know it was and um we stayed at the uh oh gosh it was the something motor court i can't even <laughs> it was it was a sorry state of affairs walking in there man the the pool had frogs all in it it was like kind of a green slime on it which my sister still managed to go swimming in the, the beds were like, you know, you get in, you kind of sink to the center, sure. like cobwebs everywhere. And it's just, yeah, man, every family vacation was like that. We always kind of like, <laughs> we were kind of shrinking in the back seat as we'd pull up to the place, wondering what we got that time. So you're, you're lucky, man. <laughs> yeah. And Lori, Lori does an excellent job of that. Actually, and I, I get, there's no way that that suicide shower was one of those places that she bought. <laughs> Yeah. So you're lying. Well, that was <laughs> that was that a suicide was also show. so yes. So the second time we went to Costa Rica, we wanted to see you know three very different parts of the country than the one we had stayed in you know years ago, and one of those areas had almost no lodging, and she found this really cool little house to rent and it was a great price and it was gorgeous as in the middle of the cloud forest there um but yeah it had one of those very typical uh showers that you see with the electric heater um these are very common in south america and central america Dude, it had bare wires you texted and me a photo this one like... was as far as those types of shower heads go was even worse than the usual because it was just not wired properly and i remember i sent it to you just knowing how you yeah. would react Dude, yeah, i was like do not stand in that shower and turn the water on you will die i can right. guarantee it yeah well we didn't die we did use the shower i'm pretty sure i wore flip-flops but <laughs> yeah. doesn't matter ah oh, come on man it's just wall current It'd be Dude, fine that it's thing not is... gonna <laughs> there's too much resistance oh my God. um but yeah yeah it was still i mean for every other reason that was a great place um so i i don't 
I don't bemoan the shower. I think Lori, if anything, having way longer hair and way thicker hair than I do at this stage in my life, uh, she she liked it less because uh, the shampooing did not work so well in that it's shower like trickle, with his little yeah. water pressure and his, the short amount of time we had with hot water. Well, I'm so. going to be honest. I was expecting a suicide shower in that Napa house that she rented for us because she did all the accommodation <laughs> booking. Oh, come on, man. That was uh, – and it was tough to find a place that could ha- that could house nine people. It was great. Yeah, Even with just job. a couple of months' notice, which you know was short notice for a big group, it, w- it turned out to be a really great place, and uh, I don't think we trashed it too bad. No, it was fun. <laughs> there might, there so, might be a wine glass or two missing. So I'm curious, um, you know, thinking about the name of this show, how do you think about spending – pre-fi and somebody who is you know very actively charging towards you know an end point if you will we talk about it a lot on the show and what the market has done and what's you know gone on with your you know your portfolio value and how you're pushing really hard to get to that fi line do you think about how do you think about expenses and choosing to spend on things or not and is it influenced by that journey yeah i mean naturally it is i've tried to to uh you know, change the business revenues. So I'd have a different calculus, a different slope to the curve. So that's been helpful. Um, yeah. but honestly, when we were taking this trip, you know, that th- those changes hadn't been implemented yet. So I was feeling a little, I was feeling a little tight, you know, I thought, okay, it's, it's a big expense getting across yeah. the country and, you know, renting the car and the house and the meals and all the activities we did. And I think Laura and I just talked about it and said, you know, this is important to us. Uh, um, and we're not really going to put a, a hard upper limit on it because this, you know, this feels like what we would spend for a vacation. And yeah. we had canceled the vacation earlier in the year for other reasons. And so we, we were really looking forward to this as a break. And, you know, the way I think about it is we set allotments for everything. We, we have an investment allotment, but we yeah. also have a vacation allotment. We, you know, we want to spend on you know, upgrading things in the house, laptops, cars, whatever it might be. And it all fits in there. And so it feels okay to me to okay. spend, but uh, you know, I, I definitely think, um, if I'm spending more than the budget, it's coming out of my investment, you know, my savings. And I don't like that feeling personally. Right. Um, but I have Laura on my shoulder saying, Hey, you know, this is also about living life. And I, th- if I think about the memory dividends that were created, in that experience, it just reinforces the idea that, you know, we, we save to be able to create those memories and be able to do things. We don't just save to make a bigger pile. And, you know, it was great being able to do it with, you know, friends and spend the time that we did. I wish it could be longer, man. I was kind of bummed that we had to come back after a week, but (laughs) yeah, time flies. Yeah. I I mean, for me, I think, I've noticed, and I'm sure, you know, we've certainly talked about this. I remember in, in so many words, but for me, I found it much easier to contemplate, you know, large one-time expenses pre RE as opposed to post. I think Lori and I were good about, you know, I think we had a pretty reasonable approach to like paying ourselves first and our investment goals. And, you know, we could have achieved five sooner, like some of the folks who are younger than us have done, right? in their thirties or, you know, I couldn't have hit it that early, but you know, maybe earlier in my forties, um, had we not spent on the things we did with vacations, you know, travel being our biggest expense for sure, besides housing, obviously, um, you know, but we prioritize that. And I don't think we ever really thought twice about it because we felt we were being reasonable in the number of trips and the kind of travel we did. But I'll be honest with you, post RE, I had a lot harder time with it, especially in the first two years. I, I've really noticed a shift in the last year. I have some ideas on what might drive it. I'm not certain. Portfolio. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's not portfolio size, man. I'm telling you, it's not. Um, because I think I had to have a mind shift change. It had to come from a couple different standpoints. Because, you know, while I had 18 months pre-retirement of really, you know, thinking about budget and doing things I had never done before, tracking expenses, really understanding what that retirement budget was going to look like. That was helpful. It prepared me a lot, but it's still very different to say, okay, now there's no paycheck. And now, even in that first year when the market was still going strong, unlike the second year, um, it still gave me pause to think about, well, this is the this is my budgeted amount. And what happens if I need to go over sometime? We actually had more cushion. We talked about this on the show in the beginning because Lori was still doing some tutoring. 
And in that first year of Two Sides of Five, she was doing a bunch of tutoring. Uh, and then that started to tail off, which was her plan. There was nothing wrong with that. But now we were more limited, to use a phrase, to the money we had planned to allocate for our budget. And so that works great 10 months out of 12. But then you'd have two months where things would suddenly go up. You know, dental implant, something I mentioned, something severe with the car. And we are not so prescriptive with our sinking funds that they're massive and no matter what they're going to cover every possible expense that's not been our approach so basically you're saying jay that your ability to spend um pre-fi versus post-fi on something like a luxury item or a luxury experience is just way more constrained and see i that's hard for me to believe yeah it's not actually constrained it's it's a mental shift that i've only gotten better at in year three I freely admit that in the first two years, I would, you know, I'm not saying I wouldn't spend on things that were necessary to spend on, but it would give me way more pause than I would have it. Um, and I, I think I was more just so over focused on this idea of like, well, uh oh, well, maybe the budget isn't going to work, even if it's only one month or two months out of 12 where we're exceeding our allotments. And maybe even going beyond some sinking fund, as can happen with healthcare. I wonder if we're um, I wonder if we're both just suffering from the same consequence of the market being down at the same time. Because <laughs> I mean, I mean, you, you know, the, it was going it, it up for help. a little while, right? While you were early retirement, but then we had 2022, which was like a long, slow slide, yeah, into oblivion. And you got to watch the portfolio go down, and I was doing the same thing, man. I was like, you know, so that doesn't. I know your experience leading up to Phi was like, okay, the, you know, it's going up and up and up to the right. And that hasn't been my experience here. Right. <laughs> you know, right. my lead up to Phi is very different than yours just because of what the market is doing. And, you know, if you got a large portfolio at a certain point, that's going to move a lot, you know? And so that, you, do you don't feel like that was influencing anything? That certainly influenced things, especially in year two when the market was down as much as it was, but it wasn't, I'm not willing to, to sit here and tell you with a straight face that that's the only thing because I know, and I, I have just, you know, I've determined for myself and I'd be curious what others experiences have been who are retired already, that there's a difference between knowing the math and then the human psychology of really believing and trusting in what you know what, to be true. But what's the difference? Right? And honestly, well, <laughs> let me explain, you know, I, I think it was only when I shifted to, uh, the sort of, you know, Cape, uh, adjusted uh, withdrawal rate and the way I started tracking that, that I became way more comfortable with living the math, not just looking at math. Let me explain. So when I was doing a fixed withdrawal rate, I knew based on all the work that Karsten and others have done, if I pick you know, an appropriately low fixed withdrawal rate, it's going to be fine. Okay, good. Okay. And I was withdrawing below that. But I wasn't really thinking about that difference between what I, you know, what is safe at 0% and where I am, you know, whatever I'm at. But once I started with a CAPE adjusted rate, you know, because, you, you know, you, we talked about this and you rightfully kind of poked at me a little bit about it, um, saying, well, you're still withdrawing below it. And I am. I am withdrawing below it, but I'm now actively kind of just keeping track of what I'm spending versus what uh, the maximum I could spend. And so essentially, I have visibility on a buffer that I didn't have before. And so now when all of a sudden we have a month with crazy medical expenses, right? You know, Lori uh, unfortunately had to go to the hospital. Uh, our teenager had to go to the emergency room. I had a dental implant. Things kind of went nuts. We're way beyond our allotment for medical. But I saw, I, you know, convinced myself, you know, this is not something to worry about, you know, because irrespective of that one big month, we've been under budget to at worst at budget for the rest of the year. And, and, you know, I honestly just had to sit there and tell myself, well, let's say your retirement's 40 years. That's 480 months. If a handful of those months go wild, who cares? They're not material. And so whether that's for scary stuff or for really exciting good stuff, like the dinner we talked about, it's not going to move the needle. So, I, I mean, I, it sounds like such an obvious thing. I'm sure there's people in the audience just nodding along like, duh. I've come to the I've come to the totally obvious realization that no matter how well you budget and stick to it, you're going to have months, if you want to pick a unit of time, that things are going to go off kilter. 
And that's going to be okay because they're not going to move the needle over a 30 or 40 year retirement. That's the fundamental lesson. Yep. And it took and you two years to learn it. For sure. <laughs> And, and maybe it's maybe it's turning 50. Maybe it's perspective on lifespan. Uh, you know, just because you're you're healthy uh, and you don't have any pressing, you know, concerns doesn't mean that, you know, how many years you get to enjoy your fire. Right. And so you can't let that restrain you from enjoying special moments or from properly handling things that happen that are negative, that cost money, right? You, you've got to deal with it. Yeah, there's no question that there's a big change going from saving and accumulation phase to to the drawdown, you know, spending phase. Uh, yeah. There's no question something's going to change. And, you know, you, you did a great job uh, at saving and you're just not so good at spending. So it's like a muscle, right? You, I mean, you got to exercise the muscle <laughs> yeah. and get used to it. And I'll also trust yourself. And hopefully the past couple of years have built some, some trust in that number. You know, this conversation just makes me think about, you know, when we're spending money, you really have to think about where you assign value. So like, if you had to sum it up, where do you assign value in terms of spending? Is it objects? Is it experiences? Is it yeah. saving time? What is it? I mean, certainly experiences, memories, Agree. you know, sharing with others in my life are always the easiest things to think about. You know, I just think about, you know, the, the travel we took after COVID lockdown ended to see family five weeks on the road. Um, I think about, you know, the, the tri trip that we took up north with you guys for my 50th birthday and our 50th birthdays. Like those are no brainers. You're spending time with family, friends, you're making memories, things you can't replace. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to be reasonable with expenses. You're not going to, you know, empty your account. But that's so easy to prioritize. Whereas, you know, the kind of, I don't know, tangible items, devices, whatever in your life, you need to think about them in a little different way. But I think some of the same principles apply. Like, are you, you know, what's the, what's the value you're going to feel out of this? Is it going to really bring joy to you, your family, or is it just, you're scratching some itch like, Ooh, the shiny object, this is cool. I mean, I don't think either of us spend like that anyway, so it's not really the best example, but I don't know. How do you see it? I mean, sometimes I spent, I'll spend on something like a nice watch that I wanted or a nice jacket or something, you know, I, I don't put place a lot of high value on clothing or shoes or anything, but, but I can see how some people value those yeah. things in general. Like I'm, I'll, I'll pay for comfort. You know, like I'll upgrade, you know, seat in a plane, for example, because yeah. I don't like sitting in the back of the plane getting bounced around or I'll pay for, you know, privileged access to the front of the line pass at a theme park with my kids because, you know, it's a day we're going to spend there. I might as well spend it on the rides instead of waiting in line. Like I won't save on those kind of things. I don't see the value in that. I'll 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 spend to buy my time back like almost universally um, yeah. if I can afford to. But yeah, no, I, I experiences are top of the list, man. I'm so glad we we did the trip that we did. And I'm so glad that, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to see what we come up with for our 60th. Hopefully I'll reach five by then. Uh, I think you're going to be there well before uh, you're uh, <laughs> well before you're 60 based on uh, how, how great of a businessman you are and are, are driving your, uh, your streams of income. I have full confidence. I would I would invest in your company if you sold shares of oh, yourself. Oh, really? Okay, How's that's that? interesting. <laughs> that's a vote of confidence, man. I did not actually expect that. Ah, I, I never had that thought until I just sat here. Uh, but yeah, for sure. I have full faith in your ability as an entrepreneur. All right, man. Well, happy birthday to you. It was awesome And time. to you. Yeah. It was Cheers, an awesome man. time. <laughs> Thank you.